spiritual reality is far more real. The spiritual world is far more real than the visible, tangible world that you and I see. Now, that doesn't mean this world is not real. It's very, very real. Uh, but what we do is we relate to that, this part of the world through our five senses, through what we hear, see, smell, taste, and touch. And that's the way we connect with this world. But there's another dimension, as you well know. There's that dimension of the spiritual world where the real activity is going on. And everything that is going on in that spiritual world has a direct connection or has a direct application and influence on what you and I see here. And so, as I mentioned to you a few weeks ago, a lot of times we fight, we're trying to fight the right battle, but we're fighting it in the wrong arena. We're fighting it in the wrong place. And so today what we want to look at is a profound statement that Paul made in the book of Ephesians. And this really struck me as I was preparing you know, we've been focusing primarily, except for last week when we looked at Nehemiah chapter 1, but all the rest of the time we've been looking at Ephesians chapter 6 for five, for five other weeks. But there's uh, the, the, the stuff that Paul talks about in all of Ephesians is predicated on something that he said in the first chapter, what we call the first chapter. And that is this. He said, I pray that you will experience all of the spiritual blessings that God has given us in heavenly places. In heavenly places. Okay. And then he goes on and he talks about that. Now, the book of Ephesians, if you remember from past years that we've been here and where we've talked about this, the theme, the, Ephesians 1.3 is the theme of the entire book. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places by Christ Jesus. That's the whole thrust of the book. Then the book itself is divided into two sections. Chapters 1 through 3, Paul teaches us about the principle of abiding in Him, the principle of being in Christ. And then after he talks to us about the principles in which he describes many of those blessings, I think there's eight different blessings that he specifically identifies in the first two chapters. But when you get to chapter 4, the thing changes and he says, So I beseech you, that you walk worthy of the vocation to which you've been called, whatever that is. And for chapters 4, 5, and 6, he makes practical applications on how we ought to live our lives. When you get to chapter 6, he talks about the parent-child relationship. He talks about the husband-to-wife relationship. He talks about the employer-employee relationship. And then he talks about it in the whole body of Christ as Christians. And the last thing he talks about before he closes the book is this idea of the spiritual battle. All right, now, here's the point I want you to get. <clears throat> the reason that what Paul teaches us in the last three chapters, well, in all of the book, is predicated upon the statement that he makes in this prayer that Paul prays. There are two prayers in the book of Ephesians that Paul prays and has written it out to the people because he wrote to them. He says, this, I'm praying for this, praying this for you. And the first prayer begins in chapter, in verse 15 of chapter 1. And so I want us to begin with that point because all of the authority and the power that you and I need and the courage and the weaponry and everything else that we need for spiritual battle is totally and entirely dependent upon what Jesus Christ did. Had it not been for what he did, it would not be possible for you and me to be able to do the battling and live, fight from victory instead of trying to fight for victory. Because you see, that's what God has called us to do. If you remember when the first Sunday we too looked at this, we focused on the words when he uses the word stand. And it's the idea of occupying a territory or a region or a principle that has already been accomplished. We become an occupation force. Jesus Christ won that and he took that. The Bible says that Christ came John speaks this and says, the Son of God came that he might destroy the works of the devil, you see. And so what we do in our spiritual warfare and in wearing the armor and in taking the, sh the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the rhema of God, while we're doing all of that, we have to remember the only reason we can do it and be victorious is because of what Christ did. So we can't take credit for any of this. 
So let's look at this passage of Scripture if we can. And I've, I printed it in the bulletin. You know, we're not passing out our hymnals and, and our Bibles this year because of COVID. So I just print the script, Scripture in the bulletin. So follow along. Let me read through this real quickly. And, and there's a, a, a series of different passages there. We skip from, f- through the first two chapters. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And then he jumps up to verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might which He brought about in Christ. And here's the key. When He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Then jumping to chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and in sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit of that is now working in the sons of disobedience. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ. So as you read that, it becomes evident, doesn't it, that the only reason you and I can live in victory as followers of Christ is not because of anything that we've ever done. It's not by how hard hard we try, how holy we try to become, but it's simply because of what God did in Jesus Christ. Now, if you study, take the note sheet and study that when you get home, but let me just point out a few things from it very quickly, uh, because there are in, in, in verses 15 through 19, and this is under Roman numeral 2 if you are looking at the sheets, there is a progression to what, what the, Paul prays for us. He prays that we will have, a, that we will have wisdom, a, a comprehensive understanding spiritually. He prays that we will, will experience the spiritual knowledge from God that He has for us. He prays that we will, uh, our, we will have an enlightened understanding, that, that the truths of God's Word will be illumined to us. And then he continues on in verse 18 and says, we, I, I pray that you will have the understanding of the hope of His calling. What does it mean? I mean, what, you, you need to understand why He called you. You need to understand why He saved you. He didn't save you just to take you to heaven. He saved you to use you, you see. And, and until that happens in our lives, we're living lives that are incomplete. And then he talks about recognizing the glory of his riches, this abundant wealth of inestimable value that we have, these spiritual blessings. You know, and it's not just the material stuff. I mean, God blesses us material, but he, he, he is so committed to, 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 to in, uh, teaching us to, 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 be, to rejoice in who God is and all that God does in our lives. How long has it been since you just thank God that He loved you enough to save you? I mean, think what, what, what if God was, uh, was highly selective? What if this idea of whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved? What if God didn't put the desire in your heart for you to call on Him? You would still be lost. You would still be without hope. I mean, everything, all of the Spirit's blessings that you have it's because of what Christ did. If Christ had not died, been ra- raised from the dead, and then gone to the right hand of the Father as our mediator and as our representative, and then brought us up and seated us with Him at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. Now, bef- just so I, I don't forget this later, 
you think about this. What does Paul say in, in chapter 1, the last part of chapter 1? He says he put everything under his feet. And then he describes it. And everything he describes is in the realm of the spiritual world. Now, it also has application in the physical world. But primarily, he's talking about the spiritual world. So he's put everything under his feet. Now, if he has raised us, in fact, Bob and I were talking, our son-in-law and our daughter are here, in case you didn't know, Bob and Sherry. And Bob and I were just talking yesterday about this passage of Scripture. And the fact that everything that is on the feet of Jesus, because you and I have been seated with Christ in the heavenlies, it's also under our feet. Now, I want to make sure you understand that that doesn't make you special. But it does make you blessed and it makes you equipped. So that there is not a thing that comes against you that you cannot successfully battle. And the reason for that is because Jesus is the one that gained the victory. And you and I, when we do spiritual battle in whatever form it may be, we are doing it from victory already secured, not in order to gain victory. So just keep that in mind. You know, like my dad used to say, just stick that in your bonnet and hang on to it. But anyway, this is what we see. And, and there's a, one passage in verse 19. There's a little phrase that I want you to understand. And it's, it's the use of the word power. Now, in the King James translation and some of the older translations, many times these words are translated the same, but they're actually different words in the Greek text. And, and the means by which we see these things happen in our lives and the means by which you and I are able to have victory in our lives is because of the power of Jesus Christ. Now, when, when, when He calls us and when He equips us, He gives us authority. He, he said, all authority, Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, so go. Go, as you're going. Basically means, as a way of life, as you're going through life, go pre spread the gospel, preach the gospel. Go to every nation, every, every creature. So it's the word authority. Now in Acts 1.11, he uses a different word. When his disciples say, okay, Lord, all this has happened just like you said it would. Now you're back and you're telling us you're going to leave and go to heaven. It says that this must be the time you're going to set up the kingdom, right? And Jesus said, well, that's really none of your business. Only my Father in heaven knows when that is. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So you have authority and power. And you've heard me say this before. Authority gives you the right to do something. Power gives you the capability to do something. Now, if you do one without the other, it won't work. You may have authority, but you don't have power. The authority means nothing. If you have the power, but you don't have the authority, you're not able to do it because you don't have the authority to do it. You're like, in a lot of ways, you're like a police officer who stands in the middle of the intersection. And he doesn't have the ability to stop all of these vehicles, except that he has the authority to do it because he was commissioned to do it. So he has the uniform and he has the gear and the equipment to do that because he has the authority to stand in the middle of that intersection and direct traffic. He also has the power. You understand what I'm saying? And the end result is traffic flows smoothly, hopefully. It's the way it is with us. But then we have this third element that most people don't talk about, and that is that this entire thing was actually a judicial transaction. It's, it's a matter of legality. Because we also have the authority, we have the power, and we have the judicial right to take action. But it's not our right to make the decision as to how to be judicial. Our, judi our dis judiciary activity, if I can say it that way, is, is rested upon what Jesus Christ did as Paul described it in Romans 9, in, in uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. Now, you know, uh, are you catching that? Do you, you get what I'm trying to, you know, communicate here this morning? And so what we see is that what Christ did at the cross and in His resurrection and His ascension to the right hand of the Father is the, is the completed activity. Look at, in, at point number four just real quickly. Here's what he did. God raised him from the dead. He seated him at his own right hand. He exalted him above all terrestrial and celestial rule. And then he gave, gave a rule and authority to the past, present, and future. There, your past, listen to me, your past may not be the, the cleanest in the world, but I'll tell you what, and on the basis of the authority and the work of Jesus Christ, it's gone. It's gone. 
So, like Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. You catch that. So don't allow the enemy to come along and beat you over the head with your past. If you have committed your life to Christ, he has taken that past and he's buried it. I love what Corey Ten, ben, Corey, uh, Ten Boom said about uh, your sins. The Bible says he buried them in the depths of the sea and she went on to say, and God has posted an old fishing sign. <laughs> don't, don't let him bring that stuff up. And if your past has been taken fair care of, then you have confidence for the present, for here and now. And you have hope and confident expectation for what the future may hold. See? It's like the old song, I don't know who, hold, what holds, who holds tomorrow. No, I don't know what to, tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. That's the way it goes. You see? And so we, we need to grasp this. And then he also, it, it says he... He put everything in, uh, under his feet in subjection. And look at this. He gave him, listen, he gave him to be head over the church. Not you, not anybody else, but he is the head. Now, if Jesus Christ, who did all that stuff, is the head of the church, then that means that everything that you and I do and everything that you and I are a part of are under his headship, under his lordship. And then the kicker for the whole thing is chapter 2 and verse 6. He's raised us up and seated us together in heavenly places. Now I want you to think about that. Now that this is not a name it and claim it thing. This is just a statement of fact. When God works in your life, He is working from that position that you have been born again, you have been raised with Christ and seated at the Father's right hand so that everything that Jesus accomplished through His great act of salvation has practical application to you and now. To you here and now. Now, if you look at this, we just want to—I just want to point your your attention to a couple, two or three other passages of Scripture. I mentioned one a little bit ago, First John three eight. The Son of God appeared for this purpose. You get that? For this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. And then I love what Paul told the Christians in Colossus, but he, and I love this picture. It's, 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 a, it's a Roman military picture. Whenever a Roman army would go out, let's say Titus, whenever Titus would go out and he would conquer land, he would bring captivity, captives back with him, and many times it would be the, the general of that army, the, that opposing army. And they would have this long parade that would stretch sometimes for a mile or more. And you'd have all of the Roman soldiers and so on. But the people that they would put at the beginning of the parade would be the captive king. And he would be at the front of the parade and they would put, make a public display of the defeated enemy. That's what Jesus did. When he went to the cross and when he died and rose again, he destroyed the works of the devil. So first of all, that means that everything that Satan tries to do by whatever means he may choose it is illegal because he's already been defeated. And the second thing is that he's been put on display. And this is what it says in Colossians 2. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities... He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Him, Jesus. And then there's this interesting verse of Scripture, and I won't take time to dwell on this, but it's always fascinating. In Romans 12, 11, the story here is, this, is the story of when, when Satan was deposed from the heavenly realm, lost his roles and lost his rights. And it goes on and it talks about this, that they, the Christians, the follower of Christ, followers of Christ, they overcame Him because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. And so here's the thing that you and I need to understand. When we pray, we are giving testimony to the reality of this truth. What is it that gives us the victory? It is our faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It is through the blood of the Lamb. And when I looked at this, and I, I remember studying this years ago, and I'd forgotten, 
The word that is used here in the Greek language literally means a massive hemorrhage. When Jesus died on the cross and he shed his blood, it was not just blood trickling from his hands, the wounds in his hands and his feet. It was a massive hemorrhage. It was a flow of blood that was so overwhelming that my guess is, if I understand it properly, almost every drop of blood in his body probably came out within the next few seconds. The Bible tells us life is in the blood. He gave his life so that you and I could live in victory. And so it, when you talk about this little statement that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, what he's saying is they overcame him because he hemorrhaged out his life in our behalf. Paul said in the fifth chapter of Romans, he said some people would die for a good man. Some people might even die for a guy, somebody that's not so good. But in verse 8 of chapter 5, he says, but God proved his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He hemorrhaged for us. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, Paul John said, that cleanses us from all sin. But he also says the word of their testimony. They had a bold explanation of what Christ had done. They were able to, they had the courage to speak it in whatever circumstance they were in. It didn't matter. They just, by the word of their testimony, and by this, they, what is a testimony? What is a testimony? It's a, it, it also is a, is a legal term. It's talking about a court, a, a trial. And you have people that are witnesses that come up and give a testimony. What does a witness do? A witness, a witness ha, does, isn't there to convince anybody. A witness is there to tell his story. A witness simply tells what he saw, what he heard, what he knows, what happened. So the word of their testimony is this. You don't believe God? Look at my life. You don't think that God loves you? Look at what happened to me. Look what happened to my brother, to my sister, my mom and dad. The word of their testimony. The, you know, you can't, and then it's, the word is plural there for they, they. So it's talking about many people. What do you have to have? Where The Bible says where there are two or more witnesses, the thing is true. And so by the corporate or the partnership of bearing witness to the, to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the fact that, 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 as John said, Jesus did come to destroy the works of the devil by the testimony, by the testimony. You can't keep quiet. And then it, the last thing it says is they didn't live, love their lives even to the point they were willing to die and they gave no thought. This is basically what it says. They gave no thought to their own death. It didn't matter. I remember the young man, I still, I can't, it just, I mean, you talk about being convicted. I've been a Christian since 1944, and I'd never heard anybody say this. And the young man that started our Farsi ministry in Ukraine, and he, uh, when he was telling this story and, and, uh, and just sharing his heart, he said, you know, it's not hard for when we Muslims become Christians, truly committed to Christ, it's easy for us to tell our story. And he said, the reason is because we're not afraid to die. Wow. Think about that. Can we come to a point in our lives where we are so willing to share our story that even if we know it may take our, cause our death, we're willing to do it. That's what those guys down in Ecuador, I think it was, did years and years ago. Those guys that were in the plane, remember the story? Elizabeth Elliot's, you know, she wrote about that. 
I remember hearing a guy named Nick Ripken, his pseudonym had been in the Horn of Africa and so many dangerous places in Somalia and other places like that, Bangladesh. And he told the story of meeting with some Chinese pastors. And the Chinese pastor told the same thing. Because they had already counted the cost before they had gone. And so they were willing to go knowing that it may cost in their lives. Well, we're coming to a point in our country, if things don't change, to where it may be the same way for us. It's easy for us, former Muslims, to share our faith openly, maybe carefully, but openly, because we're not afraid to die. Well, we need to close. Let me just finish up. Let me just make these final observations that I wanted to point out. You can see the conclusive comments. Spiritual warfare is real. It's not going to go away. Every one of us is involved in it one way or another. But Satan was judicially defeated when Christ died and rose again. We have all of the protection we need. We have the weapon that God gave us, the rhema of God. But this is the last thing, and I want you to look at this. When we see what the enemy has done to us, and others around us, and when we see what he continues to do in stealing, killing, and destroying, it is time to take a stand and to take the stand. Doing so requires the following. You need to be tired of getting pushed around by the enemy. You need to get tired of failing to see victory over a habit that you have. You need to get tired of having a dull mind that has no interest in spiritual things. You need to get tired of being afraid to tell your story to somebody. I mean, somewhere you need to put your foot down and say, enough is enough. I'm not going to do this anymore. That's the kind of decision that we have to make. I th see it as being angry, angry at the enemy. Have you ever thought about what he has done to the lives of some of your friends and your family members. How their lives have been destroyed because of the influence of Satan. Has it made you mad? Has it made you mad that you are still struggling with this particular thing that you can't seem to get a handle on? I mean, I, I believe it's time. That, I don't mean to be un, that, that we are to be unkind or angry and shout and you know, spout off all kinds of terrible slogans. But what I'm saying is there has to be that point where you're angry enough that, and you are courageous enough that no matter what the cost, wherever he leads, I will go, as the songwriter said. And then to also be stubbornly steadfast so that you won't quit. You won't quit. When you are in the middle of a battle and you win, and then you quit and walk away, what's going to happen? Same thing that's happened in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places with military. The spirits of Taliban comes back in. You see. When you stop being salt and light and you're part of the world, then corruption returns. Rot and decay returns. And so when we think in terms of spiritual warfare, we need to understand it's an ongoing battle. And we need to understand that we have to be steadfast. When you go back to those original words that we looked at the beginning of the study, the word stand, and the word to stand is not only to occupy, but it is to stay there. To stay on your post, to stay on guard, to refuse to give in. Don't let, when the enemy comes, don't back off. The power of Jesus Christ has not changed. So that wherever we are, whatever we're doing, be steadfast, be steady, be committed, be consistent. Don't give in. You've heard somebody say, don't give up, don't give in, don't give out. That's the way we ought to be. Just say, I won't be moved. I'm going to stay with it. You may experience a lot of pain and wounds and 
end up with a bunch of scars. But God will be faithful. He'll be faithful. Well, let's pray together.